Welcome to the Wallace Collection. My name is Flora Vesterberg. I'm an art historian and broadcaster, and I've visited many times before to see Rococo masterpieces like Fragonard's newly restored The Swing, as well as Venetian paintings by Canaletto and Sevres Porcelain. But today, I'm here to discover something new. I'm standing in the dining room of Hartford House, built in 1767. I'm surrounded by 18th century portraiture, as well as two sketches made for Louis XV for the Palace of Fontainebleau. The Wallace Collection holds fine and decorative arts collected by the four Marquesses of Hartford, as well as Sir Richard Wallace, the alleged son of the fourth Marquess. His widow, Lady Wallace, bequeathed the collection to the nation, and the museum opened in 1900. The museum has always been forward-thinking. From exhibiting Manolo Blahnik to the recent inspiring Walt Disney exhibition in collaboration with New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm meeting Arthur Bayle, the Hutton McRoberts Assistant Curator of Ottoman, Middle Eastern and Asian Arms and Armour to discuss a few of my personal highlights of the collection ahead of the exciting Asian Art in London summer event. Arthur, thank you for having us at the Wallace Collection. What an inspiring morning. We both studied at the Courtauld Institute of Art, but very different subjects, and so I'm thrilled that Asian Art in London has brought us together. Your advocating an art historical approach to princely arms and armour is somewhat underlined by our meeting here amidst works of Italian art from Canaletto to Titian to Guardi. It also reminds me of visiting the arms and armour shown alongside paintings at the Gothic Palazzo Fortuny in Venice. But let's start by looking a little bit at the dagger itself. Absolutely. So this is one of my favourite objects in the collection because I think it really illustrates very well just what you need to pay attention to when studying arms and armour, which is that every object is a composite object. So what we have here is a beautiful inlaid 16th century Ottoman blade, which actually comes with its original scabbard but then it's set in a later 17th century Indian baluster vase hilt made of nephrite. And Sir Richard Wallace, he returned to London after the Prussian siege of Paris. At that point, was the collection of arms and armour already underway? So actually the initiator of the collection was the fourth Marcus of Hartford, the predecessor of Sir Richard Wallace. And he went to Istanbul as a young man in his 20s and loved the city and he raves about it in letters to his mother. And then later in life, he starts collecting so-called Oriental arms and armor at auctions in Paris. And this is something that really aligned with high society at the time. And tell us a little bit about the celestial themes we see here. The craftsmanship is extraordinary. Yes, so here we have so-called Chinese cloud bands. And the way they're executed here is actually they've cut back the background of the steel and inlaid that with gold. So that the effect that it produces is that the clouds themselves are rendered in a really nice silvery gray steel. And if you look at the parts where the gold has been lost, and you can see how deeply it's been cut to facilitate the inlay, which requires a lot of gold and really illustrates that these are objects of high status. Beautiful. And what is the significance of Paris to this specific dagger, as well as the wider collections of the fourth Marquis? Despite the Wallace collection being so closely associated with London, both the fourth Marcus and Sir Richard Wallace were actually Francophiles mm. and they bought most of their works in Paris and spent most of their time in Paris. And in fact, the first record that we have of this dagger is when the fourth Marcus of Hartford lent it to a major exhibition of applied arts in 1865, just a few years after the great exhibition in the Crystal Palace. How interesting. Well, now we're going to leave the Venetians behind and we're going to be walking to Northern Europe. We are standing not in the Wright Museum, but in the Dutch galleries amidst Dutch old master paintings. The vivid Prussian blue of the silk walls reminds me of the pigment that characterized many of the objects in the Japan Courts and Culture exhibition that featured in the last episode of this Asian Art in London series. Firstly, what is the significance of these Dutch galleries relative to this dagger? So you wouldn't actually be able to tell now but when Sir Richard Wallace lived here, this is where he exhibited his so-called oriental arms and armor. And it's just off the Great Gallery. 
which I think really illustrates just how important this part of the collection was to him. And how did the fourth Marquis approach collecting and acquire this specific dagger? So this dagger was actually bought at auction at Christie's in 1867 by the fourth Marquis. And it was bought off the estate of Charles Spencer Ricketts, who was a Navy officer. Unlike many of his contemporaries, the fourth Marquis of Hartford wasn't associated with the East India Company or with British India, but he was a high society man in Paris and was friends with Napoleon III, for example. And that's the context in which the collecting of these objects should be considered. And we can see poetic inscriptions here. I know you studied Persian and Arabic. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Absolutely. So, in fact, almost a third of our objects in the Arms and Armour collection have inscriptions of some kind. Mm -hmm. And these range all the way from poetic inscriptions to quotations from the Quran and the Bible, and then all the way to signatures and things like marks of ownership. Um, but what we have here is two half lines of Persian poetry, and they're a declaration of loyalty. But in the middle, we have an aphorism in Arabic, which is more of a call to humbleness for the owner. Mm. And the opulence of this dagger, does that make it somewhat comparable to contemporary jewellery and watches? Absolutely. The way I like to think of these things is that they're kind of male jewellery. And I'm often posed with the question of like, ooh, is this real or is it ceremonial? <laughs> and I think that's a false dichotomy. Um, these objects, when they're used in ceremony, derive their strength from the fact that they are real objects. My go-to comparison is like an expensive watch. It is a status symbol, but if it doesn't work and it doesn't tell the time accurately, it loses all of its effectiveness. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur, for your eloquence and also the insights that you shared with us today. Before we parted ways, I wanted to show you this exquisite oval drawing room, which overlooks the inner courtyard of the Wallace Collection. We are surrounded by Rococo paintings by the French master Boucher. The museum has inspired the work of contemporary artists like Flory Novich, who was influenced by the Rococo style. We met during the opening of Venice Biennale last year to explore the museum from afar using only a VR headset. Since the museum opened, they have been focused on publishing scholarly catalogues, of which Arthur is leading the most recent. It is focused on arms and armor from India, Iran, and the Ottoman Empire. Ahead of its release, I look forward to revisiting the Wallace Collection to learn more during the inspiring Asian Art in London summer event. <laughs>